Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Brian Gilmer. Today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about storage, how it works within the InfluxDB product portfolio, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how the innovations and the efforts we make in storage are improving your product experience with the InfluxDB products, both at the edge in OSS, in your data center if you're using our enterprise products, and in the cloud. The thing to note here is, is that we'll be talking mostly about OSS, but prepare for an excellent talk from my colleague, Phil, on how this all comes together in cloud in a high availability uh, system. So the three topics we'll cover off on today are the evolution of data storage. And this is more about the disks than the data, um, but I think it's important to understand what we're working with and why we can innovate so quickly in this space. Second, we'll be just doing a high-level overview of our approach to data storage. And then finally, we'll cover off in terms of some independent research that we found that really explains quite well how it benefits both our customers and our community using the InfluxDB products. So thinking about the evolution of storage, I think there's just one good visual that we can bring to you here. So in 1956, it cost you $30,000 to buy five megabytes of storage. That storage was so large and so heavy that it had to be loaded in a plane with as few people on it as possible to be delivered to your location. Today in 2022, you can buy two terabytes of NAND storage for $200 or less. This is literally 400 million times the storage for less than 1% of the cost. And the question is, now that storage is, can, can be considered a near unlimited resource, how do we take advantage of that? If we pivot from disks, though, to data, which is what we're really talking about, storage impacts more than just the volume of information. It also impacts how well we access that information and the types of searches and investigations that we can do through our data to get the answers we need to improve our businesses. So if we think back to that vision of 1993, and for any of you who are familiar with the Unix systems that they so logically represented in, 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 uh, in the movie Jurassic Park, we've had a lot of years of basically seek and explore. You had to be familiar with five file systems, you had to be able to navigate them, you had to be able to move through them yourself. It was really difficult and it took a certain level of expertise to be able to find the data and the information that you needed. Now let's jump forward to 2054 where we have this vision of absolutely ubiquitous information. Pivoting from data to information is one of the biggest challenges we have in this phase of the information age. And this is really where we spent a lot of time at Influx Data figuring out how can we take those raw bits of data and make them more available to you as information that you can work with, you can explore, you can ask questions and get the answers you need. I think it's really interesting that if you look at these two visions from 1993 and 2054, today's date we're almost exactly in between. And unfortunately, in some ways, I think we're a little bit closer to 1993, but I think as we walk you through today and how we're innovating and where we're investing, you'll see that we're trying to get you to that vision of 2054 as quickly as possible. So let's talk about the today of the InfluxDB storage engine. We're gonna have a ton of stuff coming out for you this week from Paul and from others on how we are rapidly innovating and investing in our storage engine to make that 2054 vision better for you. But right now, we actually have a storage engine that a lot of you have realized is very powerful. It is time ordered. That's part of our design principle. So all your data that comes in is going to be sort of stored in order of time. The underlying engine and the storage mechanisms are also create and read prioritized, meaning that while you can update and you can delete data, we prioritize workloads of getting data into the index and then getting data out via queries. The other thing is that time series data, even though we have a schema and we have a data model in line protocol, it is ultimately schemaless in that you can drop keys or tags and then you can also change the names of them. And ultimately, each time you do that, you're going to create a new time series. Being able to do that quickly and ephemerally to support the sort of velocity of data that a lot of our customers deliver can be quite challenging and we'll show you how that works. Another thing about our storage engine that we need to think about is that it's optimized for organization and aggregates. Now this doesn't mean that you can't do a single point seek. We can do that as well. But a lot of the sort of superstructure that we've built on top of the raw storage allows you to actually and very quickly request averages, minimums, maximums, groups based on those fields and those keys. 
Finally, we deal with sumptive deduplication, meaning that if you send information to the storage that is already written to storage, the overlying engine will actually take the duplications and it will dump one of them. Now change one character, put an extra space in, change a field key, whatever you do, you will then rewrite that data. But if the data is exactly the same, we're gonna assume you don't wanna write it twice. And overall, the way the entire storage engine works and the architecture we're gonna discuss here in a minute, we, we go for eventual consistency, meaning that throughout all of the multi-stage process that you'll see here in a second, ultimately through your, your creates and through your updates and through your deletes, all of your sort of distributed data within the InfluxDB ecosystem will even out for consistency, which is really good. So let's look sort of at the details of that, you know, multi-stage getting data and information to disk so that you can use it in our products. The write ahead log is really interesting in that we have it in all of our distributions. It performs a little bit differently. In open source, it's file based and that's where we're gonna focus today. But as you'll see in uh, Phil's talk later, we take a little bit different strategy and approach for a, a cloud scale product. Now the write ahead log is basically as you're writing that line protocol, it's basically appending it to a file. Right, and so that file is to disk, uh, and it is, you know, in that way, very, very durable. But it's not well organized. You've seen some things about how we handle data that's out of order, um, data that might not be formatted exactly like it needs to be for ingest. But basically, everything gets written to that write ahead log, and then there's a process that actually takes, you know, sort of the top or the tail, depending of that write ahead log and dumps it into an in-memory cache. Now that in-memory cache, because it's not on disk and it's not durable like a file-based system, it actually allows us to be very flexible in terms of how we can sort of reorganize for that particular window of, of data that's coming in. We can do some of that pre-grouping and that pre-organization, but more on a row-based sort of situation. What happens then is that in-memory cache gets put into the durable on-disk data that you interact with on the query side. That's our time-structured merge tree. And that time-structured merge tree is basically a columnar orientation of all of those organized data points written in a way that they can be very easily seeked by the time series index. And for any of you who are familiar with indexes, this is really a directory that basically tells your queries or your, any of your sort of tasks that when you're looking for these particular data sets, whether it's based on time or based on a particular uh, field key or a tag, this is where you can find it and it helps the engine very quickly get to that data to get it off of the disk and to put it into a position where it can be further analyzed, whether it's Flux or Influx QL or any of the exciting things we have coming. Now, what does this all mean to you? I think. The big concern around storages, despite the fact that we talked about virtually unlimited storage just a little while ago, uh, you don't want to be expanding the size of raw data just to make it searchable. And when we take a look, and this is actually independent research done by a university in India, we found this after it was published. It represents you know, all of the companies involved very well, but there's some places that I think it really calls out specifically why the decisions and the investments we've made in our storage engine are a benefit to our users. So if you think about compressing data, right? If you start off with 10 megabytes of data, when you put it onto disk, you don't wanna to have to have 15 or 20 megabytes of storage taken up. Now, we just said earlier, data uh, storage is cheap, why would it matter? Well, remember, it's still finite in that you have to like buy more and build more. So the more compression you have, the more data you can store per given investment. And that's pretty much the biggest piece of your cost when it comes to storing data at the terabyte scale that a lot of these companies and our customers would do. So the importance of having this data be compressed to a smaller amount is that you will be able to store more data more rapidly and make more information available to your users. You know, InfluxDB in this research study was the only technology which successfully compressed all data sets more than one to one, meaning that some of the other products that are used in these types of use cases actually expand the size of the data. Now, with unlimited storage, why does that matter? Well, you're still going to need to go through the work if you're managing it your own in an on-premises, either through open source or through our enterprise product. You're gonna to need to manage that storage yourself. And anytime you can do more with less, you're gonna get a lot of value out of the product. Another thing that it brings you is faster time to query. Now, faster time to query, of course, there's query latency. We'll cover that off in a second. But 
actually getting the data through that process you saw with the write-ahead log and then the in-memory cache and the, and the time series uh, index, all of that, getting through that process as quickly as we do, adds a lot of value. And if you think about the amount of time that it takes any of these products to put in, they're very quick. But as you get more and more up, especially like when you look at the synthetic data sets, we are putting that data to disk and making it available to the top end or the, the front end of the applications in a much more uh, speedy manner. Now, when you take a look at the large data sets, you know, especially the financial and the analytics data sets, you know, Compared to the SQL type architectures and the storage that they use, we were outperforming most of those um, situations. Now, specifically IoT, that's my favorite part of the business, of course, we were four times faster than TimeScale DB in storing that data. And that's largely because of the fact that, you know, we are based on a, a proprietary and our, our own time series indexing model as compared to a sort of manipulation or an adaptation of Postgres. So where that really matters is when you start to take a look at query performance. So especially when it comes to aggregative queries, which are those minimums and those maximums and those averages, these are the queries that the bulk of our users are writing on any given uh, you know, use case. Our storage engine and our storage model allows extremely fast and performant query times. So if you take a look at that IoT data set that we just covered, we're five times faster to query that off disk sort of in those aggregations than the SQL based solutions. But when you get up to data that's more precise, you know, much more active in terms of the granularity and the, the um, you know, the timestamp precision, we're, we're looking at 56 times faster than the, the SQL based solutions like Timescale DB. So just as a few things for you to take away, I really want you to, to follow up and take a look at, at Phil's session on how he implements storage in our cloud product. Um, because everything I talked to you about here today, if you are implementing it either with our open source or with our enterprise product, it's stuff that you do need to understand and you would need to manage yourself in terms of that, you know, scaling your storage along with your use cases um, in the on-premises. The good news is, is that he's going to show you exactly how we handle that for you in the cloud product. Our existing TSM and TSI architecture it is really good at providing fast and accurate and eventually consistent ingestion. It is very efficient in terms of its compression and it allows very fast ins insights through um, query times. Now add that and what we've done in terms of the actual code on top of the, the improvement in physical storage, faster SSDs, virtual storage, object stores like S3. Uh, this opens a tremendous amount of opportunity to make InfluxDB even faster and even more scalable. And I think you're gonna hear a lot more about that here in the future uh, sessions. And as you'll see later in Paul's Dick, Paul Dix's talk, we're not really stopping at great. Everything I described to you here today is already market leading, but what he's gonna tell you about in terms of the innovation and the future of the platform will, will blow your mind because it's only gonna get faster, it's only gonna get better, and it's only gonna support larger data sets and really allow you, and this is why I'm so excited about the storage situation at InfluxDB, is that when we think about the future of these applications, as they get more and more distributed, more and more decentralized, the innovation that we're building there in terms of being able to have your, your data sort of uh, distributed either highly in a geo um, sort of consideration or you know, through your data centers or cloud to data center to edge and sort of this, these hybrid models that are so important for industrial IoT and IoT. Our new innovations and the stuff you're gonna learn about are gonna make this even better. But it's a build on, not a build new and nothing will change for you otherwise. It's gonna be really exciting. So, other things you might want to take a look at, definitely check out the InfluxDB OSS or cloud. You can get the OSS from our GitHub page. You can sign up for a free cloud account um, on InfluxDB cloud. Forums are always a great place to sort of talk to other folks, learn what they've you know, done in terms of you know, building the storage scaling that they need to support you know, large enterprise use cases. Slack, of course, is a huge thing. You can find all of us there who are giving these presentations today and tomorrow. You can actually reach out to us directly on the community Slack. Um, you know, and check out all these other locations as well. I highly recommend Rick and Anais's book, awesomeinfluxdata.com. This is a book that I literally go to almost on a daily basis. So as I'm getting up to speed on our product, 
products and, and what they mean to our customers. The docs are excellent as well. And they do describe a lot of the sort of important underlying stuff that you need to manage this yourself. Um, you know, and finally, definitely check out InfluxDB University. Everything you'd want to learn about Influx, about the product, the user interfaces, it's all there. And our how-to guides can get you a little bit deeper on some of that stuff as well. So I want to say thank you for your time. And again, get ready for some great stuff from both Phil and from Paul. That'll let you know our storage engine is proving, and you'll see it. Thanks. Thank you.